Well, you know, I are... <laughs> I think God and Moses both just have enormous respect for each other. Come live with me. White gladiator has that same Look, the judges are not. Even the Egyptian judges are impressed. Until recently, you claimed that the Earth revolved around the sun. Welcome to History Bites. I'm Rick Green. When I think of the beginnings of space exploration, images of Apollo missions or Sputnik come to mind. But the first attempts to reach the heavens actually predate that by about 2,500 years. Around 580 BC, the king of Babylon sent his best people to work on a new technology, a technology that would allow him to put a man on the moon, if the moon had been about 300 feet away. You see, his space program was the Tower of Babel, which he hoped would allow him to reach the heavens, and more specifically, the gods. And if the Babylonians didn't make it, well, hey, a big tower is always good for tourism. So let's tune into the year 587 BC, where King Nebuchadnezzar is trying to erect the biggest and the best to impress the world. And if you want to impress people, you got to do it on television. Tonight, with his resounding victories of a nation such as Phoenicia, Palestine, and Judah, Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar has built up an impressive empire. And now, with that empire secure, the charismatic king is building up again, and I do mean up. King Nebuchadnezzar, your monuments to the gods are most impressive. You must be very proud. Oh yes, I, I finally completed erecting the temple to my god. Marduk. That's right. Well, the idols you've built in the form of Marduk, many of which seem to look an awful lot like you. I know, I know, I know. Obviously, Marduk's a Handsome devil, a god, god, handsome god. But these idols are not your greatest monuments to Marduk, nor is the temple. Let's talk for a moment about your enormous ziggurat. Oh, come on now, Barbara, you're, <laughs> you're embarrassing me. But you must be very proud. It's huge. Everyone in Babylon is babbling on and on about it. Yes, uh, you know, I often feel like having a ziggurat after a big erection. <laughs> In what scientific discipline does Babylon lead the world? Astrology. Correct. Peldar, who is the god of love? Elvis. Ishtar. <laughs> Teresa, from what material were Assyrian boats most commonly constructed? Uh, in inflated animal skins. Correct. Nebish, how do you cure a horse with a swollen head? Uh, stop telling him how great he is all the time. No, pouring a salve of figs, raisins, and oatmeal into his nostrils. Peldar, what runs along either side of the Euphrates River? Bank. Correct. Teresa, what procedure did the Canaanite god El perform on both his father and himself? A hair transplant. Castration. So, this rectangular stepped tower, your ziggurat, was built to honor your god Marduk. No, not just to honor him, Barbara, to, to meet him. I know I'll be headed to the heavens in my afterlife, but I'm a, I'm a very impatient person. I, I, I hate waiting. Plus, when I meet Marduk, I want to shake his hand, and I, I think it'll be easier to do that if uh, I still have a body. Do you really believe this is possible? To reach the gods by buying a stairway to heaven? Barbara, we know so much more now about magic in the afterlife. It's, it's only a matter of time. At least that's what my architects tell me. I spoke with a man behind the incredible new ziggurat, the Tower of Babel. Chief Tower Nautical Engineer, Chawupa. Does the ziggurat actually touch the sky? It does seem to disappear into the atmosphere. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah it does seem to, but uh, not, not really, no, no. No, we just used uh, blue enameled bricks up there. <laughs> it's a nice touch, but uh, uh, despite its height, the god Marduk will have to meet us halfway, uh, which is why we've installed a dwelling place on top for him. Dwelling place? Yeah, that's what uh, we call it, yeah. Kind of a home away from heaven. Uh, his little cottage by the Euphrates. Ah. Fascinating. What's the goal here? Wow, Barbara, first contact. Come on, to meet one of the gods. Uh, imagine what he could teach us, that the, the spin-offs could benefit all Babylonians. Uh, perhaps a way to end all wars, uh, uh, eliminate famine and disease. Marta could teach me how to win all wars and uh, 
bring extra famine and disease upon my enemies and, and, and locusts, ooh, swarms of locusts. If you could just do that, choke our enemies, locusts up their nostrils, biological warfare. Swain, back to work. So much for a coffee break. You know what, Colossus? This pyramid we're building is gonna reach right to heaven. Kid, it's just a tower. It's the tallest thing in Mesopotamia. This ziggurat will be here forever, long after I'm gone. Oh, uh oh. He was right, the tower will be here long after he's gone. Now get this, on top of the ziggurat that our good king, I better get this right, a Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> is uh, building, there's a little bonus. Get this, folks, a girl. Oh, <laughs> That's no. right, there's a girl for the girl. god Marduk oh. to lay with. Favorite. <laughs> well, what else would he do? But anyway, uh, apparently the gods need help scoring with the chicks. <laughs> Forget the animal sacrifice, it's not a chunk of dead donkey. No, it's a, it's a piece of live ass. <laughs> oh. <laughs> live ass, oh, hey. Like, oh. Uh, yeah, I'm the chosen one, all right. <laughs> How did the priests come to choose you? The priests said they like to lie with the same kind of girls Marduk likes to lie with, so if they like lying with me, they just knew Marduk would too, so it was a lucky coincidence. Really? Yeah, totally. Those guys took the selection thing like very seriously. They did an exhaustive search and they were pooped after they reached their, you know, decision. So for me to have beaten out so many other girls to achieve the position, it's a real honor. And, and the thing that gods like Marduk and Ishtar and Shamash or Nabu or who's the other guy, Adad, is that they appreciate our worshiping and, and our praying. And lots and lots of animal entrails. <laughs> no guts, no glory. As we used to say back home, you gotta pray and you gotta slay. <laughs> no slay, no pray. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Paul. Oh. Start coming to rehearsal. All right, that's right. These guys may be the most powerful beings in the universe because they make us fall in love. Isn't that right? Yeah. They uh, make the sun rise. They, they give us rain. But at the end of the day, they still need their bowl of beastie bits. <laughs> you know, I don't know anyone who hasn't recognized themselves while learning a heavy-handed moral presented by the personification of animals. And in our audience tonight, the author of this new craze, where are you? There you are. Aesop, stand up, take a bath. The top ten rejected titles for the girl on the ziggurat. Here we go. At number ten, God Bait. <laughs> number nine, Tower Tail. Number eight, The Cherry on Top. <laughs> number seven, She Who Sits on Shaft. Oh, oh no. Number six, Marduk's Girl on the Side. On the top, on her back. <laughs> number five, Head in the Clouds. <laughs> number four, a Ziggurat Butt. <laughs> Number three, Cloud 69. <laughs> Number two, God's gift to God. And here we go, the number one rejected title for the girl in the ziggurat, High Hole. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Were you nervous your first night on the job? Uh, a little, you know, because I've lied with guys who thought they were gods, but never the real thing. Mm -hmm. What's it like up there when the ziggurat? Oh, it's very nice. You know, lots of jewels, golden tables, free pay-per-view of the hanging garden. <laughs> and there's this huge couch in the middle of the room because Marduk is supposed to be pretty big. <laughs> You've never seen him? No, not really. I go to sleep pretty early. I guess he's just really quiet, does his thing and then leaves. <laughs> not the first guy I've known like that. <laughs> Coming up, the power behind the tower. The political situation in the Middle East in ancient times was basically battling empires. The Assyrians, Babylonians, Judeans, Chaldeans, Egyptians, and so on, all took turns conquering each other. By 580 BC, the empire of Babylon was on top. Nebuchadnezzar had established himself as a supreme ruler and CEO of the resurgent city. Of course, the trouble with being a CEO is you never know when someone's planning a hostile takeover. Tell me a little bit about your marriage. Oh, that's been great. Marrying a girl from Medea, it was a great alliance. You know, I've had an opportunity to see the Medeans in action, 
They've got a great army. They're the perfect ally for us against the Assyrians. And our soldiers, they just really learned a lot. But, you know, I thought they were even better architects. I mean, nobody builds a siege tower like the Medeans. I meant your wife, Amethyst, whose father you made the alliance with. No, her. Yeah, yeah, she's all right, I guess. <laughs> Now a few minutes with Andakar Runacherib. I wouldn't say I'm deeply religious, but I do like to worship Nergal. I know this god of war and pestilence isn't as popular as Marduk or Ishtar, but the way I see it, that just means he has more time to listen to my prayers. Every month or so, I give Nergal a sacrifice, a goat usually. I watch the priest slit its throat while I make a few personal requests. Then I go home and wait for the results. I've always figured that was the end of the deal, but recently I found it's not, at least not for the goat. Apparently, once the priests have sacrificed the goat to the deity of your choice, they sell the carcass to the butcher of their choice. That doesn't seem right to me. If I give my goat to Nergal, shouldn't Nergal decide what to do with it? It doesn't matter that the goat doesn't disappear on the spot. Maybe Nergal isn't hungry right now. Maybe he's saving it for later. What's the point of being a god if you can't snack? And if Nurgle doesn't get to keep my goat, does he really owe me anything? No wonder my prayers haven't been answered. No wonder my crops are poor and my 17-year-old daughter is still living at home. I filled the plain with the corpses of their warriors like herbage. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. Ooh. The get to the get to the poo-poo stuff. As the sheiks of the Chaldeans panic, Overwhelm them like a demon. In their terror, they passed scalding urine and voided their excrements into their chariots. Oh, nice, I'm huh? scalding urine. I'd like to see that, huh? So, when Dad and I creamed them at Nineveh, served the Assyrians right. I mean, you start making comments about your enemy's excrement, they'll just throw it right back in your face. The only ones who benefit from my sacrifice are the priests who are pocketing the money from selling it, and the guy who ends up with my goat on his dinner table. He really gets my goat. In fact, it seems to me the guy who's eating my goat ought to answer my prayers. So if you're out there eating a pretty skinny goat about yay high who once answered to the name Shecky, can you please find a guy for my daughter? She's not bad looking and we could really use the dowry. But how did King Nebuchadnezzar gain the manpower, the skills, and the money to engineer all his architectural projects? I received some inside perspective from his top general, Nebuzaradan. Well, our Nebuchadnezzar is no dummy. He learned a lot from the Medean army. In fact, he makes a point of learning a lot from everyone. Even his enemies? Especially his enemies. Up. What if they don't want to share their wisdom and secrets with him? He has a wisdom relocation program. First he moves them to Babylon, then he gives them perks like uh, new walks, a uh, bigger hut, permission to continue being alive. And these foreigners help to build up Babylon. Sure. When the Assyrians defeated Babylon back in 691 BC, they burned the place to the ground. And, and then diverted the Euphrates River over it. Sure, it put out the fire, but what a mess. So to rebuild, Babylon Nebi's using uh, Syrians, Medeans, Egyptians, Judeans. Nebuchadnezzar brought in Judeans. Tons of them. How did you help out the Judeans? Well, I, I conquered them and forced them to pay tribute to Babylon instead of Egypt. They just changed the name at the uh, top of the checks. But it didn't work out. No, yeah, it did for about three years. And, and then out of the blue, their king, Joey Ackham, says, I don't think I feel like paying tribute anymore. And, and, you know, what am I supposed to do? I have monuments to finance. No tribute, no towers. So, in a way, you had to siege Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why Joey Ackham went and did a crazy thing like that. I mean, he, he had to know what was going to happen if he stopped payment on my tribute. And it, you know what? Even his own prophet warned him. I gave him a scroll of the whole thing, from God to him, via me. What did the scroll say? 
that the Judeans had been sinning and had been going on for far too long, and that the big guy was going to send down a curse of destruction. All of the Judeans were going to be enslaved by the king of Babylon for 70 years, whether we like it or not. So why fight it, baby? But King Jehoiakim didn't heed the weird. No, total unheeding. The guy didn't even tear his clothes. Instead, you know what he did? He tried to have me arrested, and then he throws the scroll into the fire. Come on, you really think you can destroy the word of God by throwing it into the fire? I don't know. Well, you can't, because I made a copy. It was my idea, not God. Tonight, the Hammurabi Code. For over 11 centuries, it has been the basis of our laws across the empire. Its simple rules say, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But many are calling for reform, maybe only a tooth for an eye and a fingernail for a tooth. Are these laws set in stone? Yes, they are. Join me again tomorrow when we look at the different languages. So you exile all those Judeans after they stop paying tribute the first time, and then they go and do it again. Why are the people of Judah so foolish? Oh, no, 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 it's not the Judeans. I like the Judeans. Many of my best friends are Judean. I mean, Daniel, my dream interpreter, for example, but Judeans are fine. It's their kings. As a rule, these, these guys have been, they've been dumber than flatbread. Especially that last one, Zedekiah. Boy, he was one reed short of a basket. But didn't you personally handpick Zedekiah to be the next king of Judah after the first exile? So sue me. We return to the Babylonian premiere of Papyrus Fiction. The sundial I got here was first purchased by your great-grandfather during the war against Sargon II was bought in a little marketplace in Assyria, hand-carved by the first company to ever make sundials. Up till then, people just <laughs> guessed the time of day. Nemesis, you're on God Talk. Yeah, hi, how are you? I'm good. You have a question about the gods of the Fertile Triangle. Okay, I got five questions. I heard that Kingu gave his army paralyzing venom and <clears throat> fire-quenching breasts. Fire-quenching breath, not breasts, breath. <laughs> Okay, that answers four of my questions. My last question is, is there any way we could get a hold of some of that stuff? Because I think paralyzing venom could really come in handy the next time we go up against the Egyptians, like we could, we could like paralyze them. That's a great point, Nemshesh. Unfortunately, Kingu was killed by Monarch and is among the dead gods now. His blood was mixed with clay to create a race of servants to serve the gods. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I heard about that. It was in all the uh, creation poems, so right. I don't think we'll ever get any of that venom. <laughs> Unless you got a direct pipeline to Kenogi. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I wish, yeah. I'd settle for fire quenching breasts. I hear you. <laughs> when we come back, Nebuchadnezzar shows off his brown clay and his green thumb. These guys have been, they've been dumber than flat. The Tower of Babel may have been the most famous architectural achievement of King Nebuchadnezzar, but during his reign as leader of Babylon, he built a lot of big things, starting with rebuilding the city of Babel, which had been reduced to a ruin by various wars. Considering the location of Babylon, surrounded by desert, perhaps his most astonishing creation was a spectacular hanging garden. It wasn't so much that Nebuchadnezzar had an affinity for horticulture, he just wanted to get his wife off his back. The hanging garden is breathtaking. The vaulted terraces, one above the other. The hollowed out pillars in which you've planted the trees. It has to be one of the top 10 wonders of the world. No, no, I, I'd say top seven even. So Nebuchadnezzar likes gardening. No, no, his wife was homesick for Medea, so he asked her, how can I make this place a little more like home for you? And she said, well, uh, how about a hanging garden? <laughs> Well, she wants a hanging garden, and I thought, yeah, win-win. She gets a garden, I get a place to execute people, and then she says she meant overhanging. <laughs> well, still, still, it's nice, it's nice. I'm here in Babylon on the eve of the New Year as a who's who of Babylonians are gathering for the traditional New Year's Eve celebration. Inviting the gods of the surrounding region to come in, statues are made of the gods, and then the statues are dressed up in clothing. And what will the good gods be sporting this year? Linen. The way your daddy looked at it, this sundial was your birthright. He'd be damned 
If any Scythian's gonna put their greasy hands on his boy's birthright, so he hid it. In one place he knew he could hide something, his ass. Five long years, that donkey carried this sundial. My brother says that the name of the god of the craftsmen is Mamu, and I bet him that the craftsman god is Black and Deca, and we have a goat riding on this, so. Well, okay, now, Lara, you're out a goat. It's oh, Mumu. It's, really? Yeah. Oh, do, do you think Mumu is, like, kind of a dumb name? No, Mumu's a fine name. Really? Okay, what about the god? who is the vizier to Anchar and Anu, you know, the, the... Oh, you have a problem with Kaka's name, too? Yeah, I think Kaka's god name is crappy. Why doesn't he have a normal-sounding god name? You know, like Tiamat, or Ninhursag, or Mama Nintu... Ninchabar. Ninchabar, exactly, Ninchabar! <laughs> it's been recorded that because of an inability to communicate with each other, the Feast Tower was a complete failure. Well, you see, that's what happens when you hire too many immigrants. So when they got started building, I went up there and I said, hey, shut up, stop yakking and lay the damn bricks. That seemed to get everybody on the same page. Where do you go from here? This tower may be the first of many. Today we hope to reach Marduk. I mean, tomorrow, who knows, uh, another god, uh, Ishtar or, or Nergal. 20 years from now, we may be building towers to gods we've never even heard of today. Uh, Wing Wong, or Hoo Ha, or Eiffel, or CN. <laughs> See, with towers, skies are the limit. The first mention of the building of the Tower of Babel in Genesis dates it somewhere around the 19th century BC, about 1300 years before Nebuchadnezzar. So are the facts all wrong? Maybe not. The remnants of Nebuchadnezzar's tower match perfectly to the biblical description. The Tower of Babel was first built in Abraham's day, but was torn down and rebuilt many times. Nebuchadnezzar's tower was just the latest and the last. We don't know exactly how long it stood, but we do know that German archaeologists had to clear away over a million cubic feet of rubble to expose what was left of this once lofty ziggurat, which just goes to show that the bigger they are, the harder they fall, and the more history bites. <laughs> Marduk's father, Ink, he speaks of a thing and will instantly be created. Yeah, that's how it works. Does he ever screw up or just blurt out, oh, I don't know, a thousand flying monkeys or something dumb like that? I'm just curious, because I wouldn't want to be outdoors after Anki spoke about something like that. You know what I mean? That's a valid concern. What if he said hell and damnation or some other swear words? It would be bad, but I think Enki is usually pretty careful about what he says, though I'm sure most of us wish he'd say weekend more often. <laughs>